This episode is brought to you by Culture Community and Popeye the Kung Celebrity. Popeye the Kung Celebrity, where the customer is the star. They are located on Ponciana Drive and Market Street. Kunk Salad Catering is also available. Yo, JM, welcome to the Fit 2 series. On this episode, we'll be speaking to Dr. Nayambi Paul Campbell Dean, a community psychologist, my friend, the best chicken party sandwich maker <laughs> in the world, <laughs> University of Bahamas professor. She is going to be speaking to us today on what it means to be fit to liberate. Welcome, Nambi. What's going on? I'm good. Thank you. All right, all right. We just caught our jog. Now we're about to stretch it out. Uh -huh. I mean, I had to wait on you all morning, but I mean, that's life. Eh? I've been waiting on you for about two, better part of two decades, but it is what it is. Okay. I'm here for you. You're my friend. You know, so what's going on, dog? What's going on? Everything is lovely. Everything is lovely? Yeah, beautiful day, beautiful setting. Beautiful setting, correct. Beautiful exercise. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. So, Ambi, um, tell us what it means to be fit to liberate. So fit to liberate to me is connected to really why I was interested in psychology. Well, I first was interested in psychology because I was always fascinated by the question of why people do the things that they do. And so the more that I got into it, um, especially in grad school at the Florida A&M University, <laughs> um, just was really able to see how our minds play a role in our liberation and that we can really use psychology to free ourselves as a people. Okay, free yourself as a people. Why people do the things they do? Hmm. I think my, my, my wife may, be able to, may, may want to talk to you, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure she has a lot of questions. Everyone's <laughs> supposed to follow that up. That's supposed to be like, you know, but that's fine. That's fine. All right, Ambi, tell us about your fitness journey. Oh, my fitness journey, I guess it's been kind of up and down all around. In high school, I wouldn't necessarily say that I was into, definitely wasn't into jogging or anything like that. I danced, um, played netball. Netball is a real sport. No, it is not. Yes, no, it is. No, it is not, but that's fine. That's fine. Go ahead. I think it's in the Olympics. Maybe. Only people in the Bahamas who play netball is those people who can't make any team and want something on their high school record to say, we did some sports because I am going to get an academic scholarship. I have to show I do something physical. But go ahead. Go ahead. That's... Anyway. <laughs> and I played netball. And you, um, you just was on the team. No, I was goalkeeper. Thank you very much. Oh, I watched it that time. That's when the team scored the most points ever. Don't do it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, so netball and then in college, like intramural basketball and stuff like that. Um, I wouldn't say I really started like working out seriously until grad school when I was writing my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And it was just like the stress of it and everything, like I had to work out in order to just free that space in my brain. And it was a really important aspect of, of my process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like you say, get your mind right. See, exercise the doctor said for her to get her doctorate. <laughs> she got to get physical activity to make a important part. Okay, you understand? Yeah. Got to make it happen, got to make it happen. There are so much different areas of psychology that you could have gone into. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose the community? So I started off thinking I wanted to be a clinical psychologist and, you know, work one on one with people and counsel them. And then I realized I didn't really have the patience for that. 
<laughs> type of I didn't have the patience for that type of model or just that I wanted change to happen on larger levels of analysis and so since in um from high school I was always in extracurricular activities and so even in college I was always in different organizations and leading them and stuff like that so it was just like the perfect combination between what I was doing in the classroom and outside of the classroom, seeing that I could take this psychology thing and not just work one on one, but try and affect communities or try and affect systems. Uncle, so you spoke about the classroom. Tell us about what it. Tell us about the classroom experience. Cause I know it's different because you're not you're not doing the one on one. You're not at a center in a community per se but you're teaching, you're affecting the lives of individuals who may want to get into this area. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your, your, your teaching experience. How do you go about it? Like what it is to be in the classroom and actually teach. Because sometimes I had a college professor, trigonometry. Um, <laughs> I took it as electric because I was good at it in high school, but high school was like, we did that much of it. Right, right, so right, like, right. I could do it. So they clearly knew their stuff, but you would ask a question like, I don't understand that. And they'll say, theta plus beta equals data. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Theta plus beta <laughs> right. equals data. So they just slowed it down so everyone right. can't teach. So tell us about your teaching experience, but how you, you present it and how you, you think the message is getting across and why it's so important to, 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 to teach people what's going on. Well, that's interesting because when I first started, I, I didn't want to teach at all. I wasn't interested in it. Um, and then once I began, I didn't even really like it. Like in grad school, I didn't like it because it just required so much energy. I felt like the students wanted me to come in and do cartwheels and tap dance, you know, and I'm like, this is for you. I already know the material, <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but then once I realized that as long as it was fun for me, then I can make it fun for them. And so the material itself is stuff that I still get excited talking about. And so that moment when the student connects the information that I'm trying to relay with something in their own lives or that moment where you see the light bulb go off and like it makes sense to them, it's just like there's nothing more magical than that you know and then having students come back and say I remember when you said this in class and I use what you said in class at home or on my job or I read that book that you suggested that wasn't even a part of the syllabus that's like a major thing <laughs> um so it's just that moment that's that's really special and I enjoy I'm really Besides this a thousand page book for this one class, I'm going to read an extra book. <laughs> awesome student. <laughs> yeah. No way, no way. Well, if you fall in love with the material, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the thing that I really try to get the students to see. Like, if you're in a major and you open up the book in that major and you can't find anything that, like, sparks, then you need to change majors. Easy said <laughs> you need to do it. It's your life. But, but mommy and daddy tell me what I need to do. Yeah. It's your life though. Say no more. Say no more. What books mm -hmm. are you reading now? What's, what's the last book that you read? The last book that I read was Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents by Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. Um... I, I can't even really describe how powerful <laughs> those books were. It's a, a science fiction series that um, she wrote in like the early 1990s, late um, 1980s, but it takes place in 2024. It's set in 2024. So some of the things that she wrote about in that text are things that you see happening right now. And it's really uncanny because the, the premise is basically the world has gone through a major change because of climate and um, economic disaster. And everybody just is kind of like fending for themselves. 
And the protagonist in the book is a young um, African-American girl who just kind of like leads a group of people to, to this new awakening, this new awareness. And um, it's a really powerful text. It, it's, it's, uh, some people even like have made like a, I wouldn't say a religion, but like a practice out of the things that are proposed in that book. Yeah. Now, I've seen you around, seen flyers going around, under the center of market speaking. Um, you know, you stop, I mean, I have to remember that, you know, you stop, 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 you Tell us about that, because what, what is reparations? Why is that even important to the Bohemians? Uh, right. Because that's, that's not us. That's some of us thing, and, you know, and, and even if it, even if it was important to us, because we don't care about that, that's America, right? Mm. Um, is it practical? Is reparations practical? Mm-hmm. Well, and I why think... why is it important to, to Bohemians as well? Caribbean, you know? I think... When we talk about reparations, one of the, I think that that question, is it practical, is a question that comes up a lot. Um, and I think it comes up because people don't realize that reparations is not new and reparations have been paid to so many different yes. communities yes. for so many different things, right? Um, even the persons who were the enslavers in the Bahamas received reparations okay. when they uh, lost their property, right, yeah. um, through emancipation. So the idea of being paid or compensated for an unjust act is simply what reparations is about. And so there's the U.S. model which focuses a lot more on actual funds, and then there is the CARICOM model, which has a 10-point plan, check out caricom.com, reparations.com. And it outlines a number of different things that we mean when we say reparations. But reparations is simply about repairing the damage that was caused. And as we are a, a people that have a history of, first, the genocide of the native people of this land, right, and then um, enslavement and colonialization, then there's a lot of damage that has been done that needs to be rectified. Good stuff, good stuff. How, how is that going? Um, I think that it's a movement that is slow to catch on, but I think that the, the fuel is now being added to the fire. You see a lot more people using the word and familiar with the word, talking about it. Um, both in the Caribbean context as well as in the American context. So I definitely think that it's something that is not going to decrease, right? It's ramping up, and the, the, the call for it is just going to get louder and louder. So the chairman of our board, Sir Hilary Beckles, said that reparations is the movement of the 21st century, and, and I agree. So you have people who want to be a part of the final nation. How would they go about it? So they can check out our Facebook page, Bahamas National Reparations Committee Facebook page, and send us a message um, there or just leave a post on the page. Ooh. Yeah. You switch it up a little bit now, doctor. Okay. Congratulations. Why are you so surprised to say that? You can say it, you know. I mean, because I know you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I know you, like... I thought only sensible people got their doctorate, but now I know hey, it can't be done by anyone. Anyone can do it, <laughs> if you can! <laughs> Alright, Ambi. Um, this is either or portion of the show. So, would you prefer a private jet or a, your own yacht? I would say my own yacht, because I think the maintenance of a yacht is a lot more expensive than the maintenance of a jet. So you go with the more expensive one. Yeah, because then that means I have more money. I missed that. I got it. You put that <laughs> jet on the You got it. All right, all right, all right. 
And then I could cruise the archipelago of the Bahamas, which is something that I, I've always wanted to do. Like start at Bimini and go all the way down to Nagua. Um, no, like cruise it. No, no, no. Cruise it. Okay, I like it, I like it, I like it. Erica Badu, Erica Badu, uh -huh. or Lauren Hill. Oh, man. Ah. That's so tough. I have to go. First reaction was just Lauren, just because the miseducation of Lauren Hill was like everything to me. Mm -hmm. Like, everybody in the dorm had that CD. And like, even my roommates, like, we were, when we moved out, like, each one of us, four of us, had our own copy. And we would all play it, like, all the time. No, we, we all played it in the house. We played it. And just, I mean, that, that, you know, that CD, just, like, every song has a memory for me that goes along with it, so. Cran Apple. Oh, <laughs> Has to be Cran Apple, Jason. Has to be Cran Apple. I can say, when I met her back in 1994, she never had Kool-Aid in her life. Just like in grade 11, I never had Kool-Aid. Like, who does that, man? Like, we just didn't drink Kool-Aid. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Um, I knew about a year or two ago, your go-to dish was crap. And Don't do it! <laughs> I have to call my husband! Yeah, we need, we need, we need third party. Right dish. now! So what is your go-to dish now? What is your favorite, what is your best dish that you can eat? Honestly, you know what I've become, like, since I've been married, I have become the best chicken sauce maker. No way. I'm, I'm serious. And I never used to make chicken sauce before, but now my, my sauce is like, it's clean, mm -hmm. you know. So you give the man dirty chicken at first? No. Okay, go ahead. That's what I heard. I don't know if that's what you guys heard. It's clean, meaning that it's not like, it doesn't have like that skim of oil on the top. Mm -hmm. um, it's seasoned. It has, you know, the nice amount of slodge bonnet, because that's the only pepper that you really can use. She's trying to, she trying to spit game here. Now, I'm, I'm letting right. you know. Uh -huh. Um, it has potatoes and it's made with chicken pieces, not wings. I know that was going to be the test just now. I was going to say what you put. Now there's wings here. Yeah. No, that's not real chicken sauce. I'm sorry. What's, okay. Wing sauce is not sauce. What about the Johnny cake? My ah, chicken sauce? Chicken sauce. <laughs> you don't have to put wings? Tell me about the wings making Johnny cake, son. They're making Johnny cake. You want toast bread and put butter in it. So here you go. Finish the meal. I'm not a baker. I know where my strengths lie. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> okay, so we found out what you do like your taste in music. Mm -hmm. But you, you progressed from craft dinner to chicken sauce. Tell us something. <laughs> Tell the audience something else that many people who know you may not know this. Um, I like to jump in blue holes. It's scary. Very scary. But exhilarating. Yeah. Clean, clean blue holes, though. Like, none in Nassau, basically. Um, I mean, they have stuff in them. Moving right along. I, 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 moving right along. That people have placed in them, not like that, you know, organically evolved in them. Okay. Ambi. <laughs> Worldwide, you know, there's a pandemic going on. Yeah. Um, it's a struggle for many people. Yeah. A lot of job, where it's just... The isolation of being around family members or seeing friends, a lot of people aren't coping well. Yeah. And uh, you know, in the Bahamas, it's, it's hard to say, hey, I'm having a difficult time. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you say to those who are, who are going through something 
and then I want you to expand and say, even though it might be tough for you, how can you help someone else who you know going through something because you can tell, you can tell something is different but they're not saying anything. So first question is, how can you, how can yeah, you yeah, help? Those, like, I haven't seen family and friends have been right. inside. Um, those with kids are now becoming teachers. Right. It's not a natural thing yeah. to be parenting, even though it's, it's, it's more as a, you teach, you, you also teach life skills that actual X plus this is that. Yeah. And this is your subject now agreement. And now, you know, when kids are doing in grade seven, you might have done in grade 12. So yeah. the pressure of doing that and performing your job as well. Like, so pressure on people, how do you set some coping mechanisms? So I would first start by saying be patient with yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, be patient with yourself. Try to be patient with your, with your children. And also, like you said, even though it's difficult to say this is hard, find one person that you feel that you can be safe with and share that. Mm-hmm. You know, say, I'm, I'm, I'm having a rough time. Like, this is a bit much for me. And um, I think I need to. I need some help. And that help might just be the releasing of the of the situation, sharing it verbally. Um, if you found that you see dramatic differences in your eating patterns, you're not sleeping well. Um, where once you know, if you were stressed, you might be able to go for a jog and come back and feel okay. That is not working right? And it's persistent. Um, The changes in your mood are lasting longer than they usually would. Then I would say you might want to seek more professional help. And that seeking professional help is a sign of strength, right? Not a sign of weakness. Admitting that there's something that is a little bit bigger than you that you need help with is a sign of strength. And there's a number of different people on the island now that are providing services um, out of a, a number of different places, um, but you can go on to the Bahamas Psycholo- Psychological Association page and find um, references for, for different counselors or clinicians. So there is, a, I like what I just said, it's showing strength because when we want to get our body together, we, we hire trainers. Right. We go to the gym, you know, so I, 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 I really don't get it. If you're sick, you go to the doctor. But right. When we have Mental challenges, we don't do the people who are trained in it. Right. And, and we are now, I think we're progressing past that. We're not there yet, but I think we're moving forward. That. That's crazy. It's, 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 it's yeah. You know, the, shame, the shame of it or, you know. Yeah. You don't need no help. I, I think a lot of people, too, may feel like, oh, well, if it's an emotional issue, then it's a spiritual issue and I can just pray my way out of it or I can go to a pastor and they can pray for me. And definitely not knocking that, right? Um, But, you know, if you would go to a pastor and you were having a a heart palpitation, he would also want you to go to the cardiologist, right? right? So if the sickness is, you know, or the illness is not just here, maybe it just moved a little higher, um, then you should go to the the people that have been trained specifically right. to help you in that area. Right, because you're not you're not coming to me to do your hair if you want to do it. Right. I've seen it done many times. <laughs> yeah, I, I right. Like, you know, but you're right. Like, yeah. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, anything else you would like to advise us on? Like, sometimes is there any trick that I can use even with without being in a pandemic? You know, sometimes I may feel stress and I just need to center myself. Yeah. It's not a ongoing thing, but I just you know what. I just need to center myself, regroup, reset. Any little tricks we can do at all? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the one of my one of the things that always makes me feel better is just really breathing. And I know sometimes it sounds trite because people are like breathe. I breathe. I'm breathing all the time. Uh-huh. And like you, <laughs> you want to put your leg. Just <laughs> When you put so, miles on these legs that I had, right? Then you you can put them up like this. Yeah, yeah. I just, got you. I, I just pretend it. You know, I, I just don't want to show you up. Yeah. Go ahead, dog. So, <laughs> um, 
So we feel like we're breathing all the time, but we're actually not breathing as efficiently as we could, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes just recognizing your breath is a way to center yourself. You know, talking about spirituality, God gave life to man by breathing into man. So our breath is literally our connection to our higher power, to our spirit. And so if we could focus on it, um, it can kind of, it can definitely center ourselves. So one of the things that you can do is start by just taking 60 seconds and breathing regularly and counting how many times you breathe in those 60 seconds. And then take another 60 seconds to see if you can cut that number down by like 10 or the, like the, the, the ideal number would be between five and seven breaths in 60 seconds. And so that would really require you to do that diaphragmatic breathing. You know, when you're running, right? You want to be breathing. I'm gonna just get to the line. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Keep on moving, legs. Keep on moving. <laughs> in and out. But another one that I like, and we can do it now, is if you just take your ring finger, on, let's say on your left hand, and close your right Ready, nostril. Sir, I'm not wearing my wedding band. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, uh huh. And breathe in through your right nostril. Even by closing it down, breathe in through the left. I mean, breathe in through the left nostril. Sorry. I'm talking machine all like from left and right. Okay, no problem. All things. <laughs> breathe in. <laughs> and breathe out through the other nostril. And breathe in through this nostril. And exhale. And do that for like five rounds. Just from the <laughs> yeah. It, 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 I don't know why it works. I probably could look it up, but um, it definitely helps to focus, focus the breathing. You actually are focusing on something and letting taking your mind off the stress of everything that's around you. Yeah. So. I appreciate that. We're wrapping up the conversation. Is there any other nuggets you'd like to leave with our audience before we go? Any other nuggets? I mean, they're going to tell you how to make some Johnny Cake. So, send in your oh, best please. Johnny Cake um, um, recipes. I like, I like the like, I don't like the cake. I like the like the heavy Johnny yeah, Cake. Nah, give me the like a biscuit. Yeah. 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 Yes. I don't want my Johnny Cake to be fluffy or like 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 like, like we getting cornmeal. Um, yeah, corn don't do that. No 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 no, 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 no. And the top have to be bumpy. Ah, you know the time. You know the time. If you want, if you want base it with some butter too. When it's hot, we can live with that. Yeah. You know the time. You know the time. Yeah. Huh? All of that. All of that. Yeah. All of that. Okay. So, you even us with anything or? You um. Just want, you just want to know how to cook Johnny Cake. No, I just leave you with you know shine. Shine, Shine your light on the world. Shine. Shine your light from the inside out. And um, that's a light that you can carry with you always. So. Even in the darkness, you can shine. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nyambi Hall Campbell Dean, for coming to us and telling us about the liberation and how to center ourselves and just be more at peace. We appreciate you coming on the show today. Thank you very much. And I need you guys to tune in next week. We're going to have another exciting person on. So tune in, guys. We thank the support. Send in the Johnny Cake recipes. Shine on. JL.